aren't always perfect. They fumbled right there too. Sarah died to God, and then she even lies to God. I mean, you're saying there were some imperfections in the patriarchs right there. Then, after uh, Abraham, uh, you know, finally receives that blessing, Isaac is born. Uh, they go, and of course, Abraham, in his faith, obeys God, even past all understanding, to the point where he's about to kill his own son. Wow. Isn't that intense? Yeah. yeah. And we see from Abraham <laughs> that that's really what true faith is. Obedience no matter what. No matter what the sacrifice, whatever God calls us to do, we trust that God is creator and our loving Lord. And that we will obey no matter what he calls us to do. Amen, guys? Amen. That should fire you up. To understand that here I have God, the same God of Abraham, who took Abraham from nothing at 75 and made him the father of what we now have as Christianity and of the Jewish nation. And that that's the same Lord looking out for your life. Amen? Amen. So here, finally Isaac's born. Then after Isaac comes Jacob. Jacob has sons, and Joseph is one of them. Joseph is sold into slavery into Egypt. And you're thinking, well, what's the plan here? Well, Joseph becomes one of the most powerful men in all of Egypt, second to Pharaoh. Yeah. Finally, there's a famine. His family comes to Egypt. They end up living in Egypt in the Goshen area. And they start off with a little over 100 people. And then after 400 years, go from 100 to 2 billion. Wow. 2 million people. And that's when Moses comes in, takes them out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They go into the desert uh, right there for 40 years. And then finally enter the Canaan's, the land of Canaan, with millions and millions of Israelites, of Abraham's descendants, more than you can even count. It outnumbered the stars in the sky. Wow. At least the ones you can see, amen? <laughs> Let's uh, pick it up right here in verse 19. Come on. Come on. Come on. Chapter 4, verse, I'm sorry, verse 18. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Is it, a, is it in Romans, Michael? Come on, bro. Romans 4, verse 18. It says, against all hope, Abraham and hope believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. That's awesome. <clears throat> we just talked about that. And really, Abraham did become the father of many nations. Verse 19. Without weakening in his faith. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's will was also dead. She was almost 90. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief wow. regarding the promise of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? But was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That's awesome. It says, the promise, it wasn't just fulfilled with Abraham having the Hebrew nation, the Israelite nation right there in the land of Canaan. It says it was fulfilled even through Jesus who blesses all nations. So truly, Abraham is the father of faith for the Jewish circumcised believer, but also for the Gentile uncircumcised believer. And so, because we're mostly Gentiles in here, I don't know of any straight up Jew people who are here fired up worshiping God right now. That basically means we're all fired up that God even allowed the Gentiles to be disciples. Amen? Amen. Amen. We kind of caught the tail end of glory right there. <laughs> right after first, you know, God's people, the Jewish people right there. So here, we understand something awesome. That God has set up a lot of glory for us. Right. Now, I don't know today whether you're cranking or whether you're tanking. Mm -hmm. Come on. Maybe I do. I don't know. <laughs> but you, you might say, well, what is, what is tanking? What's cranking? <laughs> well, 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 tanking is kind of in sports. When you get just so far behind, you just say, forget it. Come on. <laughs> just forget it. That's tanking. Woo. You're still out there on the floor, but you basically, it's over. You know what I mean? You ever seen somebody end the game early? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's when you know the team's tanking right there. Yeah. <laughs> and 
then there's cranking, and that's when you're really going at it, no matter what. Yeah. Amen. Come on. You guys with me in the back row? Yeah. There? yeah. Oh yeah. Come on, bro. Reach it. Someone uh, has this kind of quote. I think this is going to be encouraging. It says, really, what it means to have faith, right here. It says, you say it's impossible. God says in Luke 18, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. You say, I'm too tired. But God says in Matthew 11, I will give you rest. You say, no one really loves me. But God says in John 3, I love you. You say, I cannot go on. But God says in 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient. You say, I can't figure things out. God says in Proverbs 3, I will direct your steps. Yeah. You say, I just can't do it. But God says in Philippians 4, you can do all things in Christ. You say, I'm not able to. God says in 2 Corinthians 9, I am able. My you say, but I just can't forgive myself. Mm. And God says in 1 John 1, I forgive you. Come on. Mm. You say, but I can't manage, I can't get by. God says in Philippians 4, I will supply all your needs. Mm. You say, but I'm afraid. But God says in 2 Timothy 1, I have not given you a spirit of timidity, mm. but a spirit of power. Mm. Amen. You say, I'm always worried and frustrated. But God says, in 1 Peter 5, cast all your anxieties. You say, I'm not smart enough. And God says in 1 Corinthians 1, I'll give you wisdom. You say, I feel all alone. But God says in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you or forsake you. Sometimes we even say, is it even worth it? But God says throughout the book of Romans, it will be worth it. Come on, bro. Amen, church. Come yeah. on. Let's jump into chapter 5 here. Come on, bro. And whether we're cranking or tanking, there's a message for us here today. Amen? Yeah. Come on, Mike. Now, chapter 5 is best divided into two parts right here. Verses 1 through 11 are quite familiar to most of us here. But understanding that, there's still a lot to be taken out of it. Amen? Amen. Basically, we got to understand something. That the Bible is always new because we're always in a new part of life right here. And isn't it awesome how when you read the Bible, you read it and it's like a whole new book. And you've already read it before, but it takes on a new characteristic. That's because God's changing your life and giving you a new perspective on life too. And so the Bible always changes. Even as we read Romans 5, 1 through 11, we're going to see some new things right here. Amen? Amen. Um, the second part of chapter 5 is going to be some, some deep waters that we're really going to have to navigate right here. And it can challenge us spiritually as we're getting into these the scriptures, but we can't be afraid of the scriptures. Amen? Amen. Instead, what we got to do is get a hunger for God's word and really salivate at this idea of digging deep into the Bible right here to get what God's trying to teach us. Amen? Amen. we got to wrestle with these in the Lord to figure them out. Amen? Amen. So let's dig on right here and uh, get into first one of chapter 5. It says, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in in our sufferings. Mm. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Come on. Perseverance. Character. Mm -hmm. And character. Hope. Nice. And hope does not disappoint us. <clears throat> because God has poured out His love and to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Come on, bro. Whom He has given us. Amen. We got an exciting passage right here. Yeah. 
basically, there's this view, and, and he's already talked about it in chapters 1 through 4, of this, this lostness of the whole world. And then there's this view of the salvation of Christ through Jesus. Jesus Christ. And it's in the faith of Abraham that this is actually taken a hold of. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he calls us to have that same faith as Abraham. Come on. What kind? Unwavering. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fully persuaded. Mm -hmm. Fully persuaded. Come on, bro. That's the faith we're talking about. Come on, bro. Unwavering. That's the faith we're talking about. Amen. That is the faith of Abraham right here. Mm -hmm. Now you know what faith really is. If you're not fully persuaded and, and unwavering, then you, you're not where you got to be at. Come on, bro. Right. right. Amen, guys? That's right. Amen. Amen. Even attacking, if you're not fully persuaded and unwavering, you're not where you got to be at with that, too. Uh, Preach it, bro. Little bro. bonus right there from Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, then, what does he say right after that? He says, Therefore, in light of all this, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Okay, so now we're jumping into this understanding of there is a cause that has had an effect on us disciples. Justified by this faith. What faith? That unwavering, fully persuaded faith, just like Abraham in God's promises. That causes us to do crazy stuff in the world's eyes. Yeah. But because of God, we do it because we have true, unwavering, fully persuaded Amen. faith. Come on. Amen? Amen. It says, because of this, we've been justified. So justified means salvation. It means a reconciliation with God. But there's an easier way to, to remember it. It also means just as if I've never sinned. Mm. Just if I've never sinned. Nice. And so... You gotta think, wouldn't that feel awesome? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on, bro. Like right now. Never sin. Mm. Come on, bro. Oh. Crazy. Would you have a little bit of swag in your step right there? <laughs> on a spiritual note? Yeah. Come on, bro. <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> if you're a disciple, you gotta see that's true. And we're gonna get into that. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in a few minutes here. Come on. But it says, because you've been justified before God, you understand, guess what comes through that? Well, the first thing is a peace through Jesus Christ. <laughs> so there's three effects. And the first one of being justified is a peace. I don't know if you remember when you got baptized. Yeah. I mean, some of the baptisms here in this church have been flat out <coughs> epic. Yeah. Nick's baptism, a Thursday night at Baker Beach, and it was this cold, stormy night. And we went out of the water, and Nick got baptized, and there's this grainy video of it, and it just looks archaic, although it's only... <laughs> One of my favorites is, is uh, Rashad's baptism. Yeah. It's literally my screensaver on my computer. Yeah. And all of us are in the water, and it's like Rashad was like this, this nuclear missile fired from the, the army of God. Coming out of the water, ready to destroy Satan's hold on the world. I mean, it was, it's incredible. Come on. And on top of that, the beautiful bay with the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge right in the background right there. I mean, it, it, it was literally the best picture of 2012. <laughs> For me, I remember my baptism. And uh, I was 13 going on 14. Yeah. Um, but I still had some wicked sin yeah. just for you parents of 13 year olds that think your kids are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> wicked sin. <laughs> Impurity. Yeah. Looking at stuff that I shouldn't have looked at. Right. Be real. Even giving in to masturbation at 13 years old right. and knowing it was against God Almighty. Yeah. Come on, bro. Keep it real, bro. Mm. I was embarrassed about it. I didn't even want to study the Bible because I knew I had to get open about it. But I didn't even know I didn't want to study the Bible because of that until somebody asked me why I didn't want to study. Mm. Finally, I studied. I got open with my family about my life because they were disciples and I was living under their roof. And I remember sitting at that table confessing. But my heart was still hard because I had a lot of bitterness towards my parents, especially my dad. And so weeks went by. Nothing <clears throat> happened until the disciples started digging into my heart. And then finally I got open about the bitterness, started dealing with it, 
And then I got baptized January 31st, 1994. Come on, bro. I remember going down the water. It was awesome. I'm down the water, and all of a sudden, these flashes of light start appearing up. Oh my gosh, God's coming back. Perfect time. <laughs> and that's, then I come out of the wall, and then literally like half a second later, under the water, I realize, no, those are just the camera flashes. <laughs> coming out of the water, and I'm fired up. Come on, bro. Because my sins are forgiven. Yeah. There's no more sin. Yeah. It's been washed away. Yeah. And I go home, it's late at night, it was about 2 a.m. My mom doesn't let me go to school the next day, they give me a day off. I was in eighth grade. Awesome. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm so happy. I'm so fired up. I have no sin. Come on. It's all gone. Come on. God doesn't see it anymore. Come on. I'm a disciple. Yeah. And I have God's spirit in me. Come on, bro. And so I went to bed more peaceful than I've ever gone to bed before. Mm -hmm. Knowing that my sin has been wiped away. Yeah. And really it was as if. I had never sinned, just if I had never sinned. You know, for us in Christ, we don't grasp what Paul is fully saying here, and we start to tank it. Because in Christ, if we've been baptized as a disciple, in Christ we should have the same peace as when we were first baptized. Just as if you came right out of the water, just this morning. You know, there's a teacher, another story here, in a class, shows the kids two pictures. One is a picture of this perfectly serene, white sandy beach, blue crystal clear water, and these few clouds in the distance, seagulls, you know, flying around, palm tree, I mean, perfect serene picture. Then, teacher shows them another one. Same beach, but now there's these really foreboding gray storm clouds coming in. These huge waves just wrecking the sand, and the palm trees just bent over. And she asks the kids, she says, which one is a picture of peace right here? And the kids in the class all think they got it. Oh, easy. first one, first one, that's the one we got. No sweats. She says, you're wrong. Because in the pictures was a tiny little owl. And in the first picture, the tiny little owl was sleeping on that serene beach. But on the second picture, that stormy, wave-ridden picture, the owl is still sound asleep. That's awesome. And so, a lot of times, for us as disciples, you know, True peace in Christ is not when everything is going well. Yeah. That we're able to sleep. Or be at peace. Right. It's when we're in the storms. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. That is true peace in Christ. That's what we're talking yeah. about. A lot of disciples, this peace escapes them. No matter, for us, we got to understand, no matter how bad it's been, no matter if it's been a really bad morning so far, or a bad week, or a bad uh, month, or a bad year, or a bad life. Amen? <laughs> no matter how this been, you gotta understand, you can have that peace because you've been justified in Christ. Amen? Come on, Amen. And you know, it's just as if you've never sinned before the law of the Lord. Come on, Come on. So that's the first thing. There is a peace that comes from being justified. Amen? Amen. The second one is it says we gain access by faith, we gain access into this grace in which we now stand. This is an awesome uh, concept right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here it says you stand in the grace of God. That means there's a continuing effect of God's grace in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Follow me on this one? Yeah. 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 A lot of Christians, they get down. Their flesh starts to pull at them. You know how it is. You snap at your wife. You get angry. You, you look at something you shouldn't have looked at. And a lot of times when that happens, we get down and there's just this, ugh, yeah. this grossness, right. this, feel, this deep feeling of real guilt we're talking about. Come on, bro. And we can start to think the Lord has left us. God's gone. Now, we got to see what the Bible says here. 
after you're a baptized disciple, and you're still <clears throat> giving all your heart to stand in the light and in the grace of God. It says that you're still being forgiven. The, the grace is like a shower that's continually washing you. Come on now. Come on, bro. That's awesome. When you first get baptized, I mean, there's just this refreshing peace about you because you've been washed of your sins. And when we sin, a lot of times we lose that peace, but we got to realize God's saying, no, you still stand in God's grace right. when you're striving with all your heart to Come walk on, with God. Yeah. You haven't turned your heart from Him. Amen. I think, uh, you know, it's refreshing. Showers are refreshing. Amen, my brothers? Amen. Amen. I mean, i got to confess, as a single guy, there are times where I went a few days without a shower. <laughs> Maybe some of you will need to confess after church. <laughs> but I remember one time I was moving, uh, the GLC was going on, and I had to give people rides. And I went three days! <laughs> oh three days without a shower right here. <laughs> and I mean, it was just... It was hard. I'm, I'm driving people, and I'm like, I just want to take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I get like an hour. I'm at the GLC. There's a lot of friends that have rooms at the hotel, and, and I just beg, them, please, please, bro, can I just take a shower? <laughs> I get in the shower, and all the stress. I mean, there's just, <laughs> and I started to cry. <laughs> I really am. I mean, I'm crying in the shower. <laughs> you know, for us, we got to see the word. It's, it's kind of like we're walking in a parched desert, but God is, is following us around with this awesome shower of grace wherever we go. Come on. Amen? Amen? And so you're in this parched desert with the standing of the grace of God, and really that's what the world is. It's a parched desert of righteousness. A lot of us, we think, well, when we blow it and we give it a temptation, like, let's, we get down. Amazing as this sounds, as long as you're striving to live in the light with all your hearts, God doesn't turn the shower off. Come on now. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And that should convict us even more because we don't want to get dirty while the shower's on. You know what I'm talking about? Wow. And so it's not like you're bouncing back and forth for grace with God. But it's really that when you're in standing in the grace of God, God is keeping that on you. That's right. And then it says, that's awesome. And now there's something else. It keeps you motivated. Right? Right here. It says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Amen. That's pretty awesome. It's, it's Right here, the ultimate effect is we're going to be with God in his glory. Doesn't that fire you up? Yeah. We're rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. Yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta really don't get religious on me, but think about that scripture. <laughs> Come on, bro. Right here, we have to understand. We sing a song. This world's not our home. We're just passing through. Right. Yeah. Right. We sing. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger, and I'm headed to heaven right here. Here, we have to see. The word hope here, it's not like, I hope one day that I go on a date. <laughs> this hope is referring to a happy certainty. Okay? Amen. Happy certainty. And so, right here, we, we rejoice in the happy certainty of the glory of God. Does that fire you up? Yeah. I mean, Come on, bro. to rejoice that one day you're going to see God's glory as a disciple. Come on. That's, that's a, and there's a happy certainty about that. Come on, bro. And you're fired up. Yeah. Here, God, it says, at baptism, already punched your ticket to heaven. Come on. Come on. It's already good. It's not, well, hopefully I'm going to make it here. We have, as a disciple, to generally say, I am saved. Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. Preach it. 
For me, when I got baptized at 13, I still had some baggage from the world, even as a 13-year-old. I was insecure and super selfish. And so my discipler would really try to get me out of myself. He'd be like, bro, you've got to be giving right here. You've got to talk. you got to be happy. you got to talk to people. <laughs> and for me, I see, well, what do I have to be happy about? Wow. You know, like, what is there? Because most, you know, kids at 13 think life is really rough. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the truth. It's a hard 13. Is, man, I'm living a hard life right here. <laughs> Parents, you need to remember that. And so I'm thinking, well, what do I have? And I think, well, what's the best thing I can think of? That, well, I was going on this retreat for this teen retreat, and I was like, I'm going to be fired up at this teen retreat. But what fires me up? Heaven fires me up. Mm, yeah. And so I just started really focusing on the happy certainty of the hope I had in the glory of God. And then to think, this is crazy. Anybody who's a disciple who's been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins Come on. shares in my <clears throat> same destination. Come on. Wow. So I'm going to this cool retreat with nobody I know, meeting all these people, and we're all going to be in heaven one day. Does that fire you up? Yeah. I mean, look around the room. We're going to be in heaven together. <laughs> That's insane. I like I mean, it. We like fun times here. Yeah, Heaven's going to blow it out. <laughs> and we, guys, as, as disciples, God has punched the tickets for the happy certainty that we're going to see the glory of God all together. That's right. We share it together. Man, man I'm fired up. And for me, as this insecure, selfish teenager, it helped me to be this crazy out of myself guy. Literally. I mean, I wouldn't be up here if it weren't for the happy certainty of the glory of God. But it transforms even the insecure, selfish, negative teenager to be fired up. I say, man, we're going to heaven again. This is awesome. Amen? So, guys, let's practice it. Okay. I want you to say, on the count of three, if you're, you're baptized inside the hill, you're in Christ, <clears throat> I am saved. Come on, Ryan. Right. 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 All right, ready? One, two, three. I am saved. Now, now, you can't say it with a frown on your face, guys. You gotta be fired up. Let's try, it. Let's try it one more time. One, two, three. I am saved. Amen. Now, now that, that's awesome, but the encouraging thing is the people around you are saved too. Let's look if the person next to you is in the Lord right here. Look at them and say to them, you are saved. Ready? One, two, three. You are It says, okay, so we're fired up the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3. Not only so, there's more. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering. Justified and peace and standing in the access of the faith through through, through faith and grace and happy certainty and, and now rejoicing and suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> let's let's keep going. First Not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering. Yeah. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Amen? Amen? Because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He's given us. Here's one of the most awesome things when you become a Christian. 
It's not just that you're justified, just as if you've never sinned. Also, God puts his spirit inside your hearts. Right. Isn't that intense? Yeah. Yeah. And so, first of all, you got to think, well, then that means you got your spirit and you got another spirit. So you actually have two spirits in you as a disciple. Yeah. Isn't that a little weird to think about? Yeah. <laughs> two spirits. And so you got God's spirit inside of you. And you got your spirit inside of you. And so now the battle is you've got to get your spirit lined up and unified with that other spirit on, inside bro. of you, God's spirit. Come on, bro. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Because that, that spirit inside your heart, if you let it get hard, it gets super disconnected from the spirit of God. Yeah. God even says if you continue to get distant, he'll end up taking the spirit back. And in Matthew 12, it says when there's no spirit left, guess what comes in? Seven more demons. Wow. I mean, we're talking some bad stuff when that spirit leaves. Because now there's a vacant house with seven more demons coming in, jacking your soul up. And that's why when people fall away, their lives are seven or even more times worse than before they became disciples. I can personally attest to that happening in my own life. Come on, bro. Sad. But here we see, there's, a, there's two spirits. Crazy. Mm. A disciple has two spirits. That's why your quiet times are so important, right? Yeah. Because that's your time to get your spirit back in sync with God's spirit. Wow. Right? right? It's not like you're praying to God up in, in the sky. He's inside your heart. Yeah. And you're trying to get your spirit focused on him so that there's some unity of the spirit right there inside you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. As you're having a quiet time, you're battling the faithlessness. Because God's spirit's not faithless. You're battling the temptation to sin because God's spirit is not tempted by that stuff. You're even battling your own laziness and selfishness because God is focused on others. And as you draw near to God and those spirits start getting connected right here, it starts driving that junk out of your life. And that's why we can understand that righteousness comes by getting close to the Lord. Yeah. Right? Well, that's why a quiet time is essential for you to make it as a disciple. Come on. Because now your heart is infused with God's spirits. He's put it there for a reason, and it's going to start to get you to start thinking righteously naturally too. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have to deny yourself. But that spirit gives you the ability to deny yourself, too. Remember what Jesus says. He says, the spirit's willing, but the body's weak. Yeah. You know, that spirit inside us wants to do awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. But we got to remember, there's always that battle against our bodies. Yeah. Right. Is that intense? Yeah. And if you missed a quiet time and a devotional time with God in the morning, you feel that weak body starting mm -hmm. to have some victories, and, you start, on, and that yeah. God's spirit starts losing in your life. Come on, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy how it just goes, and, and sometimes we, in our pride, we don't don't see it, we miss it, and we just get more and more unspiritual. Yeah. Anyway, let's keep going right here. So, before you're a disciple, no spirit, you're falling all over the place. After baptism, God expects you to live a Christian life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so, God is saying, I will give you the power through my spirit to overcome any sin that has mastered you Come on. by God's Spirit. Amen? Come on. So here we understand there's nothing the Holy Spirit can't conquer in our lives. God is getting you ready for heaven right here. And so we rejoice in our sufferings because what does suffering do? It starts getting you connected with God. Amen? Amen. Doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you're suffering, you're saying, it's time for me to pray, unless you just go to something else, which actually never even solves the issue. You with me on that one? Yeah. yeah. So suffering gets you with the strength. It gets the strength of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And what does it do? It starts producing perseverance in your life. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You keep doing that, and what else happens? Perseverance produces some character. Yeah. And when you get some character... The Bible says, then you start getting some hope. So hope that won't disappoint. Because you understand, you're actually invincible to the world yeah. when you're focused on God. That's yeah. right. So for us, I mean, even right now as a congregation, I'm feeling awesome where we're at. Yeah. I mean, you got a cool little 
thermometer right behind me right here. <laughs> Last week, that thermometer was at 4,000. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Wow. Right there. Yeah. Come on, bro. In one week, God gave us 2,700 more dollars. Oh, Come on. Come on, Jesus. Right? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, April. And uh, it's awesome that we bumped it up in this past week another $2,700. That should fire you up. It's encouraging to see God working through the disciples' hearts, the, the, the boldness of the disciples, because that's really what tagging is all about, just straight boldness. And then there, God is allowing people to give us $6,700 in the past few weeks here. Come on. Wow. Guys, it's not even our own money. Come on. Yeah. None of that is ours. Come on. We ask people for it. <laughs> Isn't that insane? Yeah. In three weeks, we asked people and they gave us 6700 bucks. Yeah. That's, awesome. That's crazy. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm just encouraged even by the hearts of people in San Francisco. Because when was the last time you gave $20 to somebody you just met? Like, in Come on. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, we have people, every time we tag, everybody usually gets a 20 at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that insane? Yeah. And so that means that there's people randomly walking around, they see us, and they give us 20 bucks. Yeah. I've never done something like that. Yeah. I don't know if that means that God has had more grace and allowed me to be in the kingdom here, right. and he has a great plan for them in the future. But here, just saying, there are some awesome people out there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we also got some hard-hearted people out there. And it's intense. You can even see God using the disciples to even make evident the hearts of the people around us. Yeah. Case in point, Aaron has a, a square card on his phone where you can swipe a credit card to donate. Yeah. It's free. You get it at Walgreens. costs 10 bucks, but they give you 10 bucks back if you get it. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. So Aaron and his team are, are tagging. And this is just a funny story I got to tell. They're tagging and they go up to somebody and say, hey, do you want to donate? And the person says, I'd love to donate. I just don't have any cash on me. I'm so sorry. And then Aaron says, well, that's totally okay because I have a square card right here. You can just use your credit card. <laughs> and the person goes, oh. <laughs> they pull out their wallet, take out five bucks, and put it in. <laughs> Through our tagging right here. And training them to not lie, amen. You know, it's cool just to see that God, God is really working. And you know, there is a little bit of suffering right there when we're out there tagging. Alright? But it's awesome when we come back together and we see how much God blessed us with. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we just gotta continue that boldness yeah. and that unity to really doing this as a church. And guys, God is gonna blow it out for us. Amen. 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 Um, it's awesome to just see these disciples serving in boldness and unity. Uh, I think for us as a church, we have a lot to grow in our character, amen? Yeah. We all do. And here's a cool thing. If you don't know what to work on, here's an easy way. You take a step back, you look at Jesus, and then you look at yourself. <laughs> Whatever is different is what you got to change. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you're discipling somebody and you don't know what to talk about, here's what you do. You take a step back, you look at them, you look at Jesus. Whatever is different, that's what you start working on right there. Amen. 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 And that's going to help us in our discipling of one another as we're doing that every single week. Amen, Amen. guys? Amen. Let's go on to chapter uh, 5 or 6. Well, we'll... Says, okay, here we go. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? This is awesome. Nice. Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So now we're talking about something interesting. We're talking about God being enemies reconciled us, and now as, as sons and daughters of God, he's going to really help us. Let's take a little bit of a rewind and go to verse 6. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, Come on. for his enemies. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. 
Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. This is crazy. Yeah. This means that we were God's enemies. We were sinners. And God died so that we would have a chance to repent and become his children. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Here, we have to see really what that's like. I don't know if you've ever watched Lord of the Rings. Yeah. 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 For me, I really like the books. I don't really like the movies of that one. When I was a kid, I read uh, the whole trilogy and all that stuff. You know, I was about three years old. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cartoons, I already, you know, they weren't doing it. Before. So, no, I'm just kidding. I was probably like 11 or 12. But anyway, so I read it through the books. And at the very end of the trilogy, and sorry, if you haven't watched it by now, spoiler alert, okay? <laughs> at the end of the trilogy, Frodo and Sam have made it all the way to the mountain, I think, of Mordor. Yes. And Frodo has to throw this evil ring into the, into the fire. Yeah. And so he goes, but he's, he's so exhausted he can't do it anymore. And he has his buddy Sam there, but Frodo's the only guy who can carry the ring because of different qualifications he has. So he's carrying it. He, he can't do it anymore. And so Sam says, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you. Frodo and he carries them in there and they throw it in and then that's it. And then the eagles swoop down and, and carry them away. Nice. And I was always wondering, where were those eagles at in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> so Come at the very end. <laughs> anyway, so here you see, okay, you know, that's a guy trying to stand up and risk his life for a good man, right? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of times, don't we start thinking, I'm, I'm like kind of like Frodo, you know? God risked his life for me because I'm a good person. But we gotta see, what does the scripture say right here? It says, no, you weren't God's friend, you were God's enemy. Mm. Woo. Preach it, bro. So really, if we were to compare it, it would be like Sam going to those ugly, orcish creatures and saying, hey, I know you're hurt, let me pick you up and bring you back to the orc hospital. <laughs> just help you. Even though you want to kill me, it's okay. I, I really want to care for you. Guys, we're a little more on the orc side right here. Amen? I mean, you see it. You wake up in the morning, you're a little more orcish. You know what I'm talking about? And before you became a disciple, you were an enemy of God. Keep it real, bro. And God rescues you. And so I'm saying, if God did that while you were his enemy, what is God going to do as... You being his son or daughter. Yeah, come on. It's a you can bet God will get you to heaven, amen? Come on. And that should fire you up right amen. there. Amen. Now, jumping into it, we got the second part of chapter 5. In this passage, this is where Paul starts talking about Adam having a profound impact on the whole world, spiritually, and actually physically. And then he talks about the second man, Jesus, who has a profound impact on the world as well. Let's look at uh, verse 12. Come on, bro. So therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned, for before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account when there's no law. Okay. Right. So, here, it's basically saying God judges people whether they got the Bible or not. Since where there's no law, you got your conscience. It's kind of like if there's no speeding limit, it's still not right to go like 150 miles an hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the speed limit's just kind of put there just to let you know, 60. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it just kind of makes it obvious. So now, now you know when you're speeding. You know, now it's a little more clear. The sin's a little more able to distinguish right here. Come on, bro. So, what does it do? It, it actually puts more people in sin when there's the law. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we're going to read about that a little bit later. Yeah. But here we understand, so God judges people, but he judges people with Bible and without Bible differently. With the Bible, it's according to the law. Without the Bible, it's according to their conscience. We know nobody lives up to both, therefore all are condemned, all are lost, and all need to be saved. Amen? Yeah. That's what he's saying right here. Wow. Verse 14. So that says, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even over those who did not sin by breaking the command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. 
So it's saying, whether the law was there or not, everybody was condemned because everybody is judged either by conscience or by law. You with that? Yeah. So it, there's a couple truths we got to get down. Number one, sin entered the world through one man, Adam. Because of that sin, guess what comes to the world as well? Death. And now we all sin, and now we will die as well. Adam brings death, and we can't blame shit and say it's his fault that I'm going to hell. It's not. It's right. your own sin's fault. Right. That's what the Bible says in Ezekiel 18. But we understand, as humans, we were actually intended to be immortal, essentially. Mm -hmm. Until sin was brought into the world, and now, because sin is corrupted and ruined the world, we are mortal beings who have a chance of going to heaven, and yet God will not let us remain immortal. We will all die because of the one sin brought into the world by Adam. You with me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. Amen. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as a result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also, the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Wow. Isn't this intense? Yes. Here, he breaks it down, the impact of Adam versus Jesus. Winston Churchill, I think, is quoted as saying, so many during World War II, so many owe so much to so few. Mm. But in Christ, so many owe so much to one man. Come on, man. The impact, it was done worldwide by Adam and Christ. But there's a complete difference in the impact. First, we got to look at what is the motive that led to this death brought in by Adam. Amen? You guys with me right there? Yeah. It says, a lot of times, we don't, we don't talk about enough, but God looks at the heart of the disciple mm. or of the person. Here, the sin of the one man is a Greek peritona. What does that mean? It means to stray. It means to miss the mark. That's what sin is. So Adam doesn't obey God. He deviates from the path, and he misses the mark. He's not following God's will. Wow. You with me? Yeah. yeah. So the motive behind the sin is the self-will. I'm going to do what I want to do. You with that? Yeah. We understand behind all sin is a self-will, not a will to do God's will. Right. Now, Jesus is cool. The gift, the gift actually is the Greek word charisma. Right? Charisma we use for like a person who who comes into the room yeah. and just lights up the whole room. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 Now, the problem with charisma though is people come in, they light the room, they just think they're so awesome. Right. They get that self-will. Uh -oh. They start getting some pride. Yeah. Yeah. Oh baby. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And what are they prideful about? I mean, it's not from them, it's from God that they have that. So, you know, Justin, I'm not talking about you right here. I you about your charisma or anything like that. I know you might be feeling guilty right now, but this isn't. I thought it was the best. Attention. I'm not talking about you right now. I'm screaming for attention, bro. But here we see, okay, so Adam, Adam has his self-will, right? 
Come on, bro. What do you see about Jesus? It's exactly the opposite. His heart was a one of self-sacrifice. Mm. That's right. Come on. Right. Saying it's not about my will. It's about God's will. Mm. And so the difference in effect is obvious. Adam's self-will yeah. brings condemnation for the entire world. Mm. Yet Jesus, his one deed of, of doing what God wants brings justification. Isn't that incredible? That a heart of self-will can condemn, while a heart of doing God's will can save. Amen. Verse 17. It says, For if by the trespass of the one man the death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant, abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Here, it's talking about death came and death reigned. Even our world today, death reigns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there's even a fear of death. Yeah. And it's, it's something where people are, are scared. It's raining, and, and it holds people captive. Mm. Mm. A lot of people don't even want to talk about death. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're like, yeah. you, you talk yeah. about your grandma, you know, Buying their own their own grave sites. Like, what are you talking about? Let's not talk about this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the old days, people when they got married, they stood in their grave sites. Isn't that crazy? Hundred hundred years ago, when there was a marriage, they would stand in their graves and make their oaths. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I kind of wish I would have known that because that would have been really fun to do. <laughs> Brittany would have been too fired up, though. But it would have been cool to have a couple of But why? Because it's a powerful thing. Even now, we don't even know about that stuff because death reigns. If we don't even know that that was what was going on back in the day. It's just so scary. Here we understand that Jesus reigns in our lives when we become disciples. But what the passage is saying is we're going to reign in life with Jesus. Right. So what does that mean? Before you were a Christian, death reigned over you. But now as a disciple, you reign over death. And all the evil in the world, and that should fire you up. Amen? Amen. Bottom line, Adam disobeyed and he fell from righteousness. Christ obeyed and became righteousness right now. Amen. Uh, let's go to verse 20. Amen. It says, the law was added so that the trespass might increase. See, the law just shows you you're a flat-out sinner. And it shows you even worse how bad it really is so you don't get off track and, and naive. Mm -hmm. huh. Huh. Yeah. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness. Come on. To bring eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is this is intense. All men are in Adam because through birth we have been also inherited death, physical death. Yeah. Yeah. Through Adam comes sin, death, and universal death. But here we have to understand: not all men are in Christ. Mm. All men will die. Not all men will truly live, just like Braveheart says, right? Mm. Here we got to understand, there's no number of acts you can do, or, or no amount of quiet times you can have, no amount of people you baptize that earns that grace of God. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen? We have to go all the way back to the very beginning. If we are in Christ, then we have to say, I have to grab hold of this peace right here. Amen. When you're taking communion, you can have the same peace as when you were first baptized. The same focus, the same perspective. It's like that shower just being turned on, right? The shower's on. The sins are being washed away. And you're pure. You're safe. The ticket is already punched. Is that awesome? Yeah. Yeah. You know, talking about suffering and, and how God works to bring salvation is incredible. I think uh, one of the sisters here, who she just lights up 
I think everybody's heart, but I'm just so fired up, is our sister Courtney. Uh, come on, Courtney. Come on, Courtney. Yeah. Hearing her share was, was really one of the most amazing people sharing I've ever heard mm -hmm. in, in all the years being around. Because she had a heart transplant at 10 years old. Mm -hmm. That's intense. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. We're, we're playing Ultimate Frisbee. You see the scar where the heart transplant was. Mm -hmm. it, it's real. Mm -hmm. You know? It's, it's like a story, but that we've never been around. Just, right. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as, as maybe somebody who, who's devoid of God, you would say, well, that's, that's, that's good, that's fortunate for Courtney that somebody was able to, to give their heart in place, and obviously they're having some kind of situation they didn't survive from, but still their heart was used to keep Courtney alive. Yeah. But when you take a step back and and you really think about what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's way, way more than that. Right. What God has done is he's taken another 10-year-old and protected them from a world of sin and brought that 10-year-old to him before their time. Amen. Come on. Mm -hmm. They haven't reached full accountability yet. Mm -hmm. They're still innocent in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And then God takes the heart, though, from that 10-year-old and delivers it to Courtney at 10. Mm. Now, of course, you can just imagine how much suffering was going on. I mean, for a 10-year-old to have to, yeah. to think through yeah. death mm. and to see that they're a day, a week away from death. Mm -hmm. I mean, that 10-year-old starts getting some perspective right yeah. now yeah. through that suffering. They start seeing the big picture. And so, for Courtney, that big picture, I mean, we, we run from suffering. Here that suffering is transforming her perspective in life. And so, God works it out. She gets the heart transplant. It goes through. And now, she wonders why. Mm. The suffering. She's, she's thinking of God. Why would God let that happen? And then when she got baptized, she says, now I know. God did it so I could be a disciple. See, do you run from suffering? Because you're not willing to look at the big picture with faith to know God has a plan. And it's not... Because you're his enemy. God has an awesome plan. Right. And it's bigger than you can see. Right. Come on. For us, we got to remember, death reigns in this world. People are, are enslaved and frightened by it. And we have to see that God is working in our suffering to teach us about a greater purpose. Yeah. Amen? Amen? That there's a greater purpose going on around us. That's right. Today, if you're not a Christ, you're not a disciple, you can have that same peace and glory. Amen? Amen. And you can rejoice in your sufferings too. Yeah. Rather than be afraid of that. Come on, bro. If you're a disciple, you gotta grab that same peace that came at baptism. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And every now and then you gotta take out that ticket that reminds you you're going to hell. God punched him. Amen? Amen. And for us, I mean, it is such a joy just to be here right? and to see what God is really doing. And I hope that in all of this, that you can understand that it is through faith that now we have these things. What do we have? We have a peace. We have access to grace. We stand in a state of grace. Also, finally, we have a happy certainty of the hope of the glory of God. And also, we rejoice in our sufferings. Because God gave us the spirit to strengthen us. Amen, guys? Amen. 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 I hope you're encouraged. Uh, love you, and to God be your glory.